Angeles. I teach in the art department, and it is my great pleasure to uh, welcome Denise Pelletier here to the University of Oregon. Um, I just want to start by saying thank you to the Department of Art and the Bob James Ceramic Foundation and to Santa Crusoe for really spearheading all these events today. Um, this is really special for me because I think Denise is a really special person. Um, I first met her in passing at a conference after I did a panel um, called Exploring New Criticism that was really trying to develop some sort of critical or theoret theoretical framework for understanding um, ceramic art in kind of an expanded 21st century field. And um, I was like walking out and she came up to me um, afterwards and just talked. And I don't know if you didn't. I do. This. I remember. Um, but amongst other things, uh, very briefly, um, I, I was kind of coming out of this panel thinking like, okay, this was somewhat productive. Um, it was interesting. Um, it was also like a really contentious panel. Um, <laughs> and, I remember. Um, I was excited about it, but I was also a little bit uneasy. And I was walking out to have lunch, and in a matter of a couple of minutes, um, I was left, after talking to Denise, I was left with like a whole new set of questions. Um, surrounding the idea of theory and criticism with ceramic art in this expanded field. And it was, it was stuff that neither I nor the panelists nor uh, hundreds of people in the room could have thought of. Um, and I think um, it was like intelligent, profound, and warm. And you know, you're at this conference where people are trying to outsmart each other. We had this, we had a panelist that was particularly just like trying to rough up people and somebody else who just, I think, would, didn't really know what he was talking about. And then lots of um, questions and arguments, and it was really great. Um, and I was, after talking to Denise, I think I was a little bit more excited and more engaged, a little bit more uncertain, um, and infinitely more focused and settled. And um, I've had the good fortune to, to get to know Denise a little bit since then in a few different capacities. And I could say that her unending intelligence, insights, and warmth um, goes into everything that she does. Um, her work has been featured in many national and international exhibitions, including those at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York, the Museum for Angwan Kunst in Frankfurt, Germany, um, Hogue Schools. Sir Togen Bosch. Thank you. In the Netherlands, I'm a stupid American, so I can't pronounce anything that's in the Netherlands. Um, Skopterens Hus in Stockholm, Sweden, uh, in Stockholm, Sweden. Taipei County Ying Ceramic Museum. She's taught widely all over the country and the world and had residencies all over the country and the world. Um, and she's currently an associate professor of art and department chair at Connecticut College. And I just want to thank you publicly for everything you've done from that day forward. And for oh, thank you, Brian. Thank so, you. Thank you. Please help me. Thank you. That was so nice. Well, I'm very pleased to be here. And um, yeah, was that the first time we met? I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah. I had seen your work before, but I had not met you up until that time. I did accept you to graduate school. I was, um, you know, this is a really weird thing because the light is in my face and I don't see anybody's faces. Is that a bad thing? Because I usually like to look at you a little. I want to see who I'm looking at. Um, and I also apologize a little bit. I'm, I'm a really bouncy person. I tend to run around the stage too much. But um, I was telling Brian just a, a moment ago that I recently had surgery on my on my foot, and I have a titanium toe joint now, so I'm, I'm totally bionic on the right foot end. Um, better to kick butt with, I've been told. So, um, with that, um, no, I, I don't. I want them off, I guess. So, if 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 that's okay, yeah, I, I want to be able to see. So anyway, I'm I'm going to just um, share some of my work with you. Um, and not all of it, obviously. I've been working for a long time. And um, when trying to get a, a lecture together, I was trying to figure out um, how to frame it. And I'm, I'm going to um, look at a recent lecture that I did at, um, at SUNY Cortland in upstate New York. Um, I was invited there in March to do um, a lecture in conjunction with Women's History Month. 
And much of my work um, has, has to do with um, uh, feminist theory and, and other kinds of um, work um, with the body, the female body in particular. And so in getting this together, um, it was a really wonderful opportunity for me to revisit certain pieces that I've done throughout the years. Um, I work in installation. I work in discrete objects. Um, I work sometimes in collaboration with people. And I do site work. And all of the work that I do um, uses the body as a central metaphor. And the other thing that um, characterizes the big umbrella or the big meta narrative of my work um, has to do with um, thinking about history. And, and how it plays into um, contemporary life or how we think about society um, and, and other kinds of things that we relate to it. So with that, to um, begin with, I'm, I'm starting this lecture. It's called Lovesick Maiden and Other Stories, Reflections on Rewriting History. And the Lovesick Maiden is, um, is a story, um, a fiction in a way, um, that um, I've been mining for a long time and um, have revisited in some very recent work that I'll show you at the very end of my lecture. So um, that's why I've got this as my um, title. I'd like to um, talk about framing, um, how we frame history, um, and how we stage information. So when I make my work, I usually start with something. It's a found object. It's a site. It's a piece of text. It's an image. I rarely, rarely start with just the lump of clay or something that comes issues from me. I usually have to work against another piece of information or something that I have. Um, the one thing I'd like you to keep in mind throughout my uh, circuitous talk will be that all histories are fabricated. History changes with who tells it or who shows it. And um, depending on its context, um, that's what the history is, temp is at a temporary place. I'd like to start here. This is an image um, by Gabriel Orozco, who is one of my favorite artists. And I'm showing you this image because clay is my primary material, even though I work with a lot of other uh, materials. Clay is an, it, it's a wonderful elemental material. It has the power to preserve all of your gestures and to transmit time. There's nothing better than this photo to tell me that. It's dirty. I love that about clay. It's dirty. There's fire. And glaze is so sexy. That's why I use it. There's a wonderful um, quote from Rebecca Solnit, who is a, a critic and a writer. And she has written recently on Maya Lin. And one of the things that she talks about installation, I would also like to take her quote and apply it to clay as a material. She says, installation is an attempt to speak the mind in the language of the body. And somehow, there's something about clay that um, um, rings true for me um, right there. In all the work that I've done for 20, 25 years, um, I'm really interested in culture and the history of culture. And there's nothing better than clay or ceramic object or material culture to talk about that. Um, the things that clay can make throughout history, history are dishes, bricks, and plumbing. That's like food, shelter, and water, the most elemental of things. Pottery itself is the most intimate and abstract and accessible art form in my mind. I think um, ceramics is kind of a quintessential marker of culture. So it's a way of speaking about culture. And mud, in its uh, most elemental form, is something with biblical connections. And it changes its state. It's transformative. One of the things that I like to do is look at pictures. And I love to think about objects. As a child, I grew up in New England. and. Um, in a place where there was um, a, a town of like uh, colonial and Victorian um, objects. And I grew to love these things, scouring the flea markets that my dad would take me to. Um, this is not something I found at a flea market, but this is an image that reminds me of those trips as a child. Um, this is a shaker um, stove for warming irons. And I like it because it's a, new, a quintessential New England kind of a thing. It speaks about history and memory. This particular image I found in a book when I was in graduate school, and it has um, continued to feed me um, for about 20, um, well, 18 years. I feel that this is a loaded in, in, image. And when I see images, 
I use language. I describe things to myself, and that makes further images and information. Objects carry meaning, and context is everything. When I, see, when I first saw this, I thought, wow, those are, that's a shaker stove. There's hot irons. They're under wraps. The shakers were celibate. And to have this thing that looked this, like this corseted dress with these hot irons inside was very sexy to me. And it was like a shaker death wish of sexual denial and pressing the flesh. This is a great little card that I got in my husband's grandmother's attic. It's a Victorian parlor game, um, kind of like Magic 8 Ball for those of you who could. But it was for young women um, who would sit around, um, bourgeois young women who would sit around and play these games. And everything on these games had to do with marriage or love or if you got kissed or you know all that stuff. And this was my favorite card. I would as soon die unmarried. Like that was like the biggest curse. The most horrible thing that could happen to you, this was the eight ball. And so I thought this was really pretty amazing. I grew up during a time um, in the, you know, I was born in the 1950s. And um, in those times, there were um, um, not as many opportunities for um, young girls or women. And um, it was imprinted on me um, as a young girl growing up um, about how I had to kind of forge my way against certain kinds of societal stereotypes during the um, women's movement and those sorts of things. So um, these were very dear to me. I look at contemporary images as well as historical images, but, these, but histories, again, are fabricated. And they also pull up history when they're contemporary. This is a picture of a Fezzi bride. It's Moroccan. Um, and this is her getting served up on a plate to get married. It's really great. It's from 1991. So I just thought this was another loaded image. But I, I, don't, I don't show it so much to um, criticize it so much as to just acknowledge that um, culture has deep, deep roots. And um, one can read it in a, in, a, in a critique, or one can read it in a celebratory fashion. So there is no one truth when one looks at history. Um, this particular um, one is one, uh, slide is something that I keep in my um, archive um, to think about the, uh, examining the way culture shapes our notions of gender. Another really great slide that I got, this is um, a wax model for the medical study um, for doctors in the 17th century from the Musea della Specula um, in Italy. Um, this is a wonderful image that stopped me dead in my tracks when I found it in the um, special collections at Alfred when I was in graduate school. And this is a, an image that um, is very highly charged um, in terms of its representation of the female body. Um, at the same time, she has a, a physical presence and a social presence. She's in this state of what looks to be, she's splayed for the doctors. She's showing her guts, her innards, her insides so that they can study. So it's, there's this real reason for her to be there. But she's also posed in this, um, almost in this erotic um, ecstasy, in an ecstatic pose. One might even think religious ecstasy at that time. So this, these complicated images became food for me um, for many years. And I still um, um, use them. This was an early piece that I did in graduate school before people were using a lot of mud and um, unfired clay in their work. And this, um, this particular piece is called Bag. And it is a bag. It's a garbage bag full of mud with a rubber band. And when you slip your hand right up inside it, it kind of sucks up your hand. And it's really kind of cool and warm and a little sexy. And then you take it out again. And then you hope you don't pinch it with your fingernail so that the mud doesn't go all over the linen wall. So I had these experiments early on so that I could think about the notion of clay as a material and, the, and, and how the material um, brings forth new associations. At the time of um, making this work, I was reading all kinds of critical um, theory and uh, feminist theory and that sort of thing. And um, there was a particular book that I liked, or actually it was a, um, an essay by Fraser Ward called Foreign and Familiar Bodies, Dirt and Domesticity, Constructions of the Feminine, which was really, really interesting, which dovetailed um, very, very nicely with um, some of the feminist theory that I was reading of um, Chris Deva and um, you know, um, Judith Butler and those sorts of things, um, where dirt is associated with femininity and also with the socially low or the transgressive. The transgressive quality of, of mud and specific kinds of dirt 
and what issues from the body. So when I say dirt, I speak about it metaphorically. Um, one of the things that I was reading at the time was a, um, a very important book by Mary Douglas called Purity and Danger, symbolic, and it's all about symbolic dirt and symbolic dirtiness, where Mary Douglas, an anthropologist, talks about anything that's dirty or considered low or transgressive is matter out of place. So something that is not where it should be or not how we expect it. So the great example of that would be a roast beef on the table is mm, so good, but it's not so good if you throw it on your bed. So in her books, Mary um, Douglas analyzed concepts of pollution and taboo, how dirt offends against order and rituals of purity and impurity become important. I'm going to go through um, a couple of pieces that I did in graduate school that were trying to respond and understand um, these kinds of concepts. This piece is called Belladonna, and it's a performance piece um, with dipped mud and a dress made of latex gloves filled with slip, which I wore um, in this ritualized um, performance. Here's a photo of me. This was during, um, this was in 1994, I think, and um, I was really taken with, um, at the time, how um, the idea of the latex glove that had become an object of mass culture. We are just coming in the middle of the AIDS epidemic. And um, prior to that, latex glove didn't have the kind of symbolic meaning um, that it did. It also came to represent um, that permeable bodily boundaries create the threat of a boundary trespass. So they actually create a threat. They symbolize that. The glove came to represent bodily margins to me or the unstable body, that body that had the threat that it might fall apart, disintegrate, or die. This particular installation was um, um, set up as a, as a cleaning and maintaining ritual um, in a repetitive cycle. And some of the work, um, some of the um, gestures that I did um, had to do with um, calling up some um, old repetitive gestures from my um, Catholic upbringing. Um, in this performance piece, people came and interacted with me in my dress that was um, had these latex gloves, and they were all squishy, almost like the Artemis of Ephesus, that um, icon of female femaleness in art history. Um, people would take these; people would come to me and, and take one off and started tying me to my environment, which was so totally unexpected. Um, it was really interesting to do this piece. I had a structure set up for myself, but I didn't know what was going to happen. And um, it occurred to me that those are rich places to make artwork. Whether or not this is a really good piece in the end, I don't know. Um, it was amazing for me to make and experience. But it also told me that in art making, one has to take the kind of risks. One has to work without a net. I started collecting other kinds of images, um, thinking about the nature of the female body. Is it, a na is it a natural body or is it a cultural body? That was a question that drove my work at this time. Um, this is a picture of Dr. Louis Sayer. He's a 19th century um, doctor, and he's examining the curvature of this young woman's spine. When I describe this to myself, I say, she's pulled in two directions. He's straightening her out. When I look at images like this, it shows also a complicated power dynamic. He's fixing her, he's working on her, he's doing what he's supposed to do, but he's also looking at her, and he's looking at her very particularly. So I started looking at images of representations of female body about shaping and correcting the female body, the female body that isn't perfect. I did a whole series of work based on these kinds of images. I'm just going to show you this one. Um, this one is called Bride. It's about 10 feet tall. It's welded steel. And these are 1,800 latex gloves filled with slip to make this fleshy interior dress. Um, I was thinking about the kinds of um, expectations that can't be fulfilled in women sometimes at the time. And this spectacle of the bride, the engulfing shape, again, had me think about, is this a natural body of the female, or is it a cultural body? And when you say that, I don't mean it literally. I mean it in terms of how the body is represented and how we view woman as a social construct. So I thought about this as this iconography as being a big fiction. So here's um, a little taste of that. It's very fleshy, very sexy. You can climb this thing. The, um, the I guess the image of it was 
first inspired by Duchamp, by his bottle rack, by his bride stripped bare by her bachelor's even. Here's another image that I looked at at the same time in terms of the representations of women. This is um, a wonderful, one of my favorite photos of um, Merritt Oppenheim um, by the artist Man Ray. So Man Ray took the photograph, and it's called The Veiled Erotic. And I really loved this kind of gender slippage that was going on with, Man, uh, with the way Man Ray viewed uh, Merritt Oppenheim, who was also complicit in this viewing. So I found this to be really interesting in terms of the power dynamic between her and the viewing male. Um, she's in front of a big printing press, and where that crank goes in this kind of uh, automated thing is a false um, phallus for her. So I was really looking at how does one manufacture an image? How does one manufacture a history? Um, this is an image of me that was taken um, while I was doing a series of work um, in thinking about how um, we're represented. And using the self is one way to do it without um, somehow pigeonholing someone else. Um, a Chinese artist uh, did this picture of me. This was a, a sculpture that um, I, her, her strategy was you go into a room, you don't know what's in it, and you have um, one minute to interact with this object, and then she's going to take a picture of you. And so when I saw this cross-looking thing with this pewter breast on it, I just stripped down, held it up, she snapped the picture, and I went. And this was a really, really interesting um, thing for me to do. Um, because after I saw her picture, and she put it in a show, and it was about five feet tall, it just shocked the hell out of me, because um, I had no idea how strong my arms were, that I had these really strong muscular arms. And, and when I saw the image, it, I was struck how um, it looked like, uh, like a self-portrait. And as a child, I, was, I really wanted to be a boy, and I used to... Um, Imagine myself as Joan of Arc. I was a Catholic girl. I had to be Joan of Arc because she was a tomboy. She was the original cross-dresser. You know, she wanted to be a boy. So I thought, well, here I am. I'm Joan of Arc. Um, that's the sword and the stone. And I'm reimagining the female body um, at the center rather than the margins of Christian imagery. Um, I'm going to show you a series of work. Um, I'm skipping some years um, just to talk about some other um, things. Um, research drives my work. Um, I read a lot. I would say that when I think about theory or history, I don't narrate the history. I read it, I absorb it, and then somehow, again, I try to work without a net. I go with my inclinations. Research drives the work, but the gestures that I take are intuitive. This is a piece um, that's a bathroom piece. I started to think about all the work that I had done and many pieces that I didn't show you about working with dirty things and taboo and things that were um, really on the more gross side of things. And I thought, well, how else can you talk about the underbelly of something or the difficult part of something? You can talk about it by using its opposite. And to me, porcelain was that opposite thing. So I started using porcelain and doing some casting and using found objects. This is a bathroom. Um, piece called Spit and Swallow. And you go into that bathroom and you observe this. At the time, um, I was thinking about porcelain as a material of using a, a pristine material to get rid of the body's dirt. Um, toilets, sinks, urinals, bathtubs. In the old days, before they had plastic, before they had stainless steel, it was glass and porcelain that people used to kind of like feed you, um, you know, receive your bodily issue, and all that other kind of stuff. So I was really kind of thinking about this. This is a hairball in a sink down low. And this is the other, um, the other part of this installation, which I had set up as like, like an ablution place, so a place where one would do one's morning ritual. Um, this was an homage to a friend of mine who died of cancer when she was only 35. And I was really um, taken by her life rather than her death. And um, the inspiration for this came from um, some conversations with her and also watching her comb her hair out in the sink um, that way. This is an ether bottle from a um, science lab, um, a shoe brush, and a, de a ceramic decal image that I made. And here's um, another image, um, the, the image that I took that decal from. It's a 19th century gynecological exam. And I had had this image for about 10 years and finally found a place to use it. My friend died of um, 
uterine cancer. And I loved this image because it's really creepy. It's a little scary. And you look at it, and a million things go through your head. Well, who is this guy? He's in his street clothes, got his hands up her dress. She looks like she could care less. She's leaning against the lectern. Is he genuflecting? Is he proposing? What up? So, you know, I mean, that's kind of how I thought about it. And so this little bit of humor um, that masks what our anxieties about taboo, about sex, about death. Around this time, um, I was doing some um, a series of installations, um, site-based work that I, I'm not showing you here um, tonight, um, um, thinking about certain specific sites where I would get the information from the site and respond to them, so using a more immediate history rather than a, an older history. So um, at that time, at the same time, I still needed to make my hands do something in the studio. So I thought, well, you know, I'm working with porcelain. I'm going to write a proposal to the Kohler company um, because I want to go to the Kohler company and use all their great toys and their free slip and their plaster that comes out of a spigot that looks like you're pumping gas. And, um, and when you make a proposal for something like that, sometimes there's a lag time. You know, you make a proposal and a year later you get your residency. So I'm doing these kind of site-based installations at the same time. I thought, well, what am I going to write a proposal for to get to work at this very cool place? Um, and at the time, I had been collecting uh, material culture. And this is one of the things that I collected um, from some old uh, flea market again. It's called Polar Ware Company, which was in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. This is not porcelain. This is, um, they would call it porcelain, but it's really enameled um, you know, metal. But it's an invalid feeder. And an invalid feeder was also one of those sanitary wear devices used to um, either feed or cleanse or irrigate the body. And so I was thinking about objects that somehow flush water through the body so that the body becomes a conduit in the way that um, sanitary wear products do. So anyway, I collected this thing and I thought, well, I was um, also collecting other kinds of invalid feeders. And an invalid feeder or a sick cup were, were used um, for the last several hundred years in people's homes. You had them in your house like a hot water bottle or a thermometer. Um, but now they're extinct. They're obsolete because no one feeds people um, in bed in that intimate way anymore. We have intravenous, which is not intimate and not careful. So I thought, well, I'm going to make a 1,000 invalid feeders at Kohler. And that's what I did. Um, this particular piece is the result of my um, summer residency at the Kohler Company. Um, and this piece is called For Mary. There's a, a little history behind this piece. Um, about a month before I was um, slated to go to my residency, my mother was diagnosed with cancer also. And I almost didn't go. And she said, oh, I'll be fine. It's a two hour plane ride. Go to Kohler. And, but it was really weird for me to be making these invalid feeders and not knowing whether my mother would um, live or die. I had gone there with a proposal because I was invited to a really wonderful site to do um, a piece at um, the John Slade Ely House Center for Contemporary Art, which is um, just outside of Yale University. Um, and um, it used to belong, the house used to belong to a doctor who died in the house at the turn of the century. And since this was a 19th and early 20th century object, um, the curator told me that after I got done with my thousand feeders at Kohler, that I could just come have the room that John Slade Ely passed away in and just have at it in that room. Um, at the time, I didn't know my mother was going to pass away right before I finished my residency. Um, so this piece is, um, again, um, in tribute to her. So you can see that the body is my primary metaphor. These are um, invalid feeders hanging from the ceiling from, um, from monofilament. And how I structured this room was thinking about this rectangle as um, an extension of the architecture in the room, almost like it's somewhere between levitating and um, being a projection. This is it from the side. So it's like a magic carpet of sorts. Um, all of the pieces on the floor follow um, this parquet, parquet flooring, which changes direction as it goes. So what you can't see in the slide very well, which is always my disappointment um, with installation work, for those of you who do installation work where the body moves through, is that when you walk in here, um, or when you did walk in here, you looked at what was on the floor, and it looked static from one place, and then it would visually fluctuate um, as you walked by it in another way. So it was a, a moving floor at the same time. So that was really, really poetic about this piece. 
one of the things I thought about at Kohler was um, the ability of ceramics um, to be dispersed through culture. That ceramic objects, particularly souvenirs, um, um, intimate things, um, dishware, you know, anything like that, figurines, um, they collect their value through touch, use, and sentiment. And um, that you can like pass them down through the ages. So they collect, they kind of like collect the way, the way clay collects the debris going down the river. And I always thought that that was really a really interesting um, notion. Here's another, um, another incarnation of that piece. And to, again, think about how ceramics is dispersed through culture is how one disperses it through history as well. So something gets handed down, handed down, handed down. Oh, that lovely little cup gets handed down. And so these sick cups um, were um, reinvented, um, thinking of a new context to make a new piece. This piece is called Vapors, and it's installed in, um, in Stockholm, Sweden, at the Sculpturen's house. And that is a contemporary art center. Um, and I, obviously, I have really a great spot in this exhibition. Um, this piece is about 30 feet long. The tallest invalid feeder at the top is probably 15 feet from the ground. And again, as you go through it, it visually fluctuates. And the, um, the uh, monofilament also goes like this, almost like uh, a musical instrument. So it's really lovely. Um, I, I conceived of this piece um, because the Sculpturen House is a very special building. It's where Alfred Nobel um, invented dynamite. So this idea about vapors, um, poof, you're gone. And also um, seeing um, the mist come up on the river that was right next door to it was the visual image that helped feed this piece. Um, I also had been doing a lot of research on 17th century um, medical treatises where the vapors were this kind of um, illness in women. Um, so that was part of that um, name. So I'm going to show this slide here. Um, there was a really important book, speaking of the vapors, that I was reading at the time um, by Lorinda Dix Dixon. It's called Perilous Chastity, Women and Illness in Pre-Enlightenment Art and Medicine. So this was a really wonderful book, and I found this image in it. Um, in this book, um, they talked about um, these maladies from women that were kind of pseudoscience, not real science. Um, and in those days, um, you know, the, one of the things that they did was um, to look at the way a woman's gesture was or how she held her body or her social presence and that that was somehow um, a window into her physical self or her spiritual self. So this particular image is called despair. And so like here's the hands in despair. And it's from um, a medical treatise called um, Hierologia, The Natural Language of the Hand. It's from 17th century, early modern Baroque period about the beginnings of modern science and philosophy. So what they were doing is showing that if a woman who was ill could hold her hand in a certain way or her head or these gestures, the doctor could come and, and basically prescribe what was wrong with her by the way she was holding herself. And I found this to be so amazing. And Lorinda Dixon has done some really wonderful um, um, research on this, and um, so so also has Barbara Maria Stafford, who's um, done some wonderful work in 17th century pre-enlightenment art and medicine. Um, but anyway, this is like the body afflicts the mind, and the and the mind afflicts the body. Um, in her book, also, she talks a lot about 17th century Dutch genre painting. So if you are looking at Dutch genre painting, um, particularly the ones of Jan Steen and some of the others, you will see that the woman who is being examined by the doctor holds herself in a certain way. And um, then the doctor examines and um, figures out what's wrong with her by what she looks like. Here's a piece that I did in response to that piece. These are invalid Peters um, also, and they're black. Um, one is, um, there's text in the side, one is Paradiso, and one is, para uh, one is um, Purgatorio. And that I took from Dante's Inferno, um, of one, when one would be. So even though that isn't a direct metaphor from this history, that somehow this gesture of this hanging thing, of this something that is base, or something that is not working, or something that is in despair, that can have its symbolic meaning in something that is nothing like it. This is a piece that I did in response to something very specific from Lorinda Dixon's book. Um, 
This is called sirens. And these are um, ceramic decals in a variety of little invalid feeders um, that um, tell you these diseases um, that they were fabricating at the time. These are pre-enlightenment female maladies. And here are some of them. Furor uterinus, which is um, you know, basically a catch-all phrase for the, for the angry uterus. Pasio hysterica, which is the wandering womb. In those days, they, they, they found or they thought that the womb wandered around the body. So if you had a hurt elbow, it's because your uterus went up there and attacked that elbow there. It's, I'm, look it up. It's there. So there's a sense of pseudoscience and that, um, you know, that basically doctors and scientists and the establishment controlled these fictions. And these are fictional histories, which do change over time. The other one um, is Morbus virginaeus. That's the disease of the virgins, which, of course, we know is um, easily cured. Um, and the doctor can cure it for you. Um, there's Coria lasciva, which is the dancing mania for those of us who like to boogie down. And um, also Deloratio vaporis, which is the crazy vapors. So these are, this is um, just this little um, vignette. Um, I started doing a whole um, um, series of work in these little intimate tableaus where I kind of put a little bit of humor, but also pack in some historical stuff. These um, um, decals were um, lifted from the garbage can at Kohler and kind of um, cut out. They, they were in these big things, so I cut them out kind of like a ransom note, you know? So like I, I took and repurposed their decals into my language. So I was clearly um, like working on work that had to do with um, um, female medical condition and how, how one sees history um, in relation to the female body. This is a picture of the Salpetriere, which is um, the Paris hospital. It's actually where Princess Diana died. But the Salpetriere has been there for um, several hundred years. Um, it was originally um, made for um, poor and homeless women and kind of a, pr a prison for the unattached. So in the late, it was anywhere between the like 18th and 19th century, um, this was the, the it was a combination of a place where doctors would treat women, but it was like your poor women went. And it was a dumping ground for prostitutes, for the ill, for um, women who were maybe insane, but maybe not. But it was, it was basically known as like the insane museum, uh, museum, this insane um, hospital for women. This is a place that has held great interest for me. Um, when anatomists proved, finally, that the uterus did not migrate, doctors relocated the center of hysteria to the nervous system. And that was in 19th century with Freud and, and um, precursors to Freudian um, psychology. Um, at the Salpetriere, um, that's where doctors, patients, and culture came together um, for this experiment in the um, kind of reemergence of hysteria and um, to reinvent hysteria. This is um, an image, um, it's a painting by Robert Fleury, and it's called Pinel Liberating the Mad Woman of the Salpetriere. So the mad women were the crazy women. They were hysterical um, and um, doing their thing. And of course, hysterical women, they're so out of control, they rip up their bodice, you know, and you know, they, they assume these sexual poses. So there was this really interesting research that I did on this erotica, you know, that how somehow that there's this taboo thing, this this crazy woman is, is on this verge of the taboo. So, of course, um, Pinel is liberating the woman, but it's so interesting. It looks like he's kissing her arm. Really, he's unlocking her shackle. Um, at the Salpetriere, um, Dr. Charcot and um, Freud did a lot of work in the late 1800s. Um, and there was a really uh, wonderful other book um, called, by George D.D. Huberman called The Invention of Hysteria, Charcot and the Photographic Iconography of the Salpetriere. And what the confluence of um, kind of scientific thought and the need to get prostitutes off the street in, in, 19, uh, in eight, uh, 20, uh, 19th century um, France, um, it all converged at the same time at the same time that photography was becoming the way of, of documenting and creating historical truth. 
So um, what happened at the Salpetriere was that Charcot was really looking into hysteria and um, among other things, he was very famous for um, a lot of other things and very good work, but um, he really took it pretty far. Um, they would photograph women um, performing their own hysteria. So women would faint and they would photograph it. Women would work uh, like kind of, he would have these things called Tuesday lessons where he would put women on stage and they would perform their own hysteria. They would take pictures of them and prove that they were indeed um, hysterical. And the women became complicit in this um, charade. So um, it was almost like um, how to act when you're insane. Um, it was a very complex um, set of power relations where um, women actually completed the transaction. Freud was a witness to the manufacture of these images, and many, many images were made. Um, at the time, a lot of the images were made in the um, kind of the specific form of the late 19th century oval um, portraiture and mirror, which also was um, a mourning a kind of a, a mourning um, form. So I did a f series of work with mourning um, commemoratives and mourning forms, um, taking some of the um, information from um, case studies from Freud and Charcot and a variety of other texts and putting them in these things. So it occurred to me that a manufactured image becomes a fabricated history. This particular piece is called Veil, um, again, based on mourning commemoratives. These are invalid feeders. And the text, you can't read very well because it's etched in glass on this um, kind of uh, bowed glass. And when the light hits it, it actually projects itself onto the wall. Um, the phrases, um, again, came from the case studies, but they were really kind of lifted out in, in ways that um, were fragmented. Um, when Freud did his studies, he drew attention to the um, women's speech, which he talked about as being fragmented and discontinuous nature of the so-called hysterics. And he said that the physician's responsibility is for reorganizing it into a coherent whole, which gives huge power um, to someone other than the protagonist. So I was taking some of these um, um, phrases and just reinserting them and creating this fictional narrative. It's a little bit creepy and scary. So some of the um, phrases that I found when they would describe these women performing their hysteria were things like accustomed to lying, prone to disappear, ripely posing, fond of travesty, passing into fiction. And this is how, this is how women were um, talked about, but with a medical context. I found very, very interesting. So at this time, I was, I was doing some, um, this whole body of work has to do with looking at the history of the Salpetriere, um, Freud and Charcot's work, and taking um, a lot of this information, not in a narrative sense, but lifting little pieces out and then constructing my own fiction um, for my imagination. So I did this set of what I would call intimate tableaus. This one's called Tuesday Lessons, after those staged les lessons that Charcot would do every Tuesday. Um, this particular um, invalid feeders are here. And why are they invalid feeders? I'll tell you in a minute. Um, um, they were, they were um, nestled in this kind of uh, rocking device um, on an 8 by 10 portrait mirror etched in French. The words also came from um, some of these treatises, and many of them with double meanings. Um, List, and um, you know, in very, very erotic, Hall of Mirrors um, was what um, some people called Charcot's um, Tuesday Lessons because the her hysterics were surrounded by and mimicking and reinforcing the images of their own hysteria. So some of these things are all in French. They, they have to do with um, um, the ecstatic body. Um, they have to do with um, being coy. You know, all these kinds of things that were very sexual in nature. Um, but posing as something that was medical. Um, one of the reasons why all of these tableaus are using the objects that are from, um, I guess, again, um, sanitary wear. These are bed pans and invalid feeders, um, nursing bottles, um, things that kind of put water in you and take water out, is that one of the things that um, they did was to elicit um, the water cure at this time. It was a very popular hydro um, therapy. Um, in the late 19th century of a way of flushing the toxins out and flushing what was bad. And so women were often um, subjected to hot water, cold water, 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 um, to somehow clean them up. This particular piece is called Vanitas. Um, there's um, a ceramic decal inside, um, hand-drawn tracing from a photograph up top of um, 
the Tuesday lessons of Charcot um, giving them. And then over here is a partial image um, appropriated from Bourneville's schema of hypnotic passes. So they would hypnotize the women, they would fall in their kind of hysterical um, fits. Um, so this is um, put out as a bride's bowl. Um, there were gifts that you would give to a new bride in those days. And um, so I had put these together here as this kind of weird bedroom, bathroom, sick room, erotic body seen as pathological. Another piece here, this one's called Locket. Twin objects cast from bedpans, fur from a woman's collar, an antique ether filter when they would put people out. Um, inside is a computer-generated decal of French wallpaper doubled over to create its own mirror image. And a little tap of the hat to Merritt Oppenheim. This piece is called Betrothed. One of the things that I was reading is that there were women who were um, put into the Salpetra who were not even, they weren't, there was nothing wrong with them. But divorce wasn't legal in France, in Catholic France in the late 1900s. And it was a way sometimes to just say your wife was crazy, because why? A lot of times they didn't do what they were told, didn't want to do, or whatever. Or maybe it was time for a young mistress. Um, so it was very you know, patriarchal. And um, so I was thinking about this idea of betrothal. Um, these are little black feeders also. And again, feeders as a kind of a metaphor for what is being fed and what is issuing out. Um, there's language on each one. Um, for the kinds of drugs that the women would be getting, anesthesia, control of pain, or to alter the physical body. So there's like belladonna and quinine and morphine and all these things that are on the sides of this particular piece. You can just about see it there, um, just um, typeset in. And this particular piece is called la somnolence, which means the sleep um, in French. Um, the glass is cast from a top hat mold, the rim of a man's hot top hat, of the kind that Charcot or Freud might have worn. Um, I have a wooden mold of it that one would put felt over. And I took that wooden mold and made a glass, um, a mold out of it, and I cast glass into it. And so those are my frames. And that's um, a human hair wig and two um, small feeders that were known as murder bottles because you couldn't sanitize them properly, and people would die of sepsis. This is a lovesick maiden painting by Jan Steen. Um, I'm going to show you some recent work, just a little bit of recent work here. Um, I've, re I, I've done a lot of other work, but I'm just trying to keep focused in my um, lecture on um, how to use history. Um, I've been revisiting these lovesick maiden paintings. These are genre paintings at the time. Um, Jan Steen um, parodies quack doctors and also middle class society. So as you can see, um, there's lots of symbolism in these um, um, Dutch paintings. So he's feeling her pulse. She's looking sick. She has, has her foot on this little box. And what that is is a heater. So inside the heater, there's these little hot coals. And you can kind of see the heater with the hot coals over there. Um, so that we are notice these are all very symbolic. So we know that there's heat going up, of her, up her dress. Um, there's everything else um, kind of makes some kind of sense. We can see that there's some eroticism here, and we don't know how much, of a how much of it is a parody or not. But Steen was looked at as a comic in his time, even though he was also looked at by some people as a serious painter. And you can see the open bed in the back. So what is wrong with this woman? Nothing that sex can't fix or something like that. Um, so in those days, um, those quack doctors would just come to um, women and um, just they would examine their urine and look at it. Say, OK, we know what's wrong with you. Um, they would pathologize all kinds of normal things. Um, hysteria these days um, has been reclassified. We still have hysteria. We reclassify it. It's reclassified as anxiety, obsessive disorders, depression, borderline personality disorders. Some of that stuff um, is really kind of alive and well in how we think about it socially, how we don't how we, who we, who we think that that is not like real illness. It's kind of the kind of illness that people need to uh, make justifications for. So anyway, I was looking at these um, lovesick painting paintings and thinking um, about how I can um, just 
start to mine them in a different way. So I began making objects from the paintings, and it, just as a way of knowing them. But um, last fall, I had a sabbatical, and I had it, my sabbatical was split. I was at Hunter College for the first half of it, um, working in the studios there. And then I went to France um, and had a residency there. And I'll show you these two pieces of work. This lovesick maiden um, uh, body of work that I'm just really beginning um, had to do with something I heard on the news. I heard lovesick teen crashes car on the news. And I thought, well, wow, lovesick. What's that supposed to mean? You know, like, of course, you know, this young woman was distraught because. Um, she was in love with another girl, 16 years old, and she was so distraught that she crashed her car, and instead of killing herself, she killed other people. This is very sensationalized. And I thought, whoa, on so many levels, this is so um, pathologized. First, it was, um, the way it was spoken about was really titillating, in a way, you know, love sick teen. Well, of course you love sick. When, Everyone's lovesick when someone doesn't love you back. There's nothing pathology about, nothing pathological about that. And I thought that that was really interesting. So I started thinking about um, like narratives, like contemporary narratives and historical narratives of the lovesick maiden. And the lovesick maiden is something that has been coming through history. And when we, and historically, you look at the lovesick maiden and the, his, and the melancholic man. Those are two kind of gender-coded forms. And um, so I started looking up uh, lovesick maiden narratives, or lovesick narratives. And occasionally, the lovesick narratives have to do with men. The vast majority are of women, and occasionally a gay man. So this is one of them. Elsie and Meta Craven, sisters of North Lord Street, were both in love with Charles Burmeister and could not agree which should marry him. They decided to commit suicide and chose carbolic acid. But when Meta saw Elsie's death agony, she refused to keep her promise. She died tonight. And these were in the New York Times, and these were in like almost like the tabloids today. So they were titillating. Um, they were really taking people's privacy in a different way and consuming the news. So I started to collect and examine some of these lovesick narratives. What a woman will do for the man she loves. Sounds like her cheating heart, but. You know, I, I really found them really, really interesting in terms of how there were similarities over and over again, how they read like pulp fiction. And these, this is news in the regular newspaper, not like what we know to be trash kinds of um, magazines in how we consume the news today. So um, here's one that I use. I was um, thinking about how to um, embody um, some of this narrative in, in, in a temporary installation that I did, or a small installation I did at Hunter College in the project space. And um, so I decided to call this Lovesick Maiden and Other Stories. And this was a changing installation um, over a period of three weeks. Um, this was the narrative that I chose. 1882, Minnie Schaefer makes a fruitless attempt to drown herself. And I had made um, a series of um, objects, again, having to do with water. So here is a piece that I had made at the Kohler Company on a second, like right before that I had been on another residency and I made these um, ba baby bathtubs. And this is a bathtub that was from um, the late 19th century from New England and it was called um, Baby Bathtub Coffin Style. So I thought that was pretty weird and, um, and putting things together in these weird provocative ways. So this was an object that I was um, refurbishing um, for this installation. So here's a view of the installation that I did. Um, I took the narrative of Minnie Schaefer and projected it on the wall from the New York Times and hand drew, drew every letter while I um, put these objects in the room. Lovesick Maiden and Other Stories is really about the stories that were told and the others that are below the surface. Here's another view of that. Um, it's kind of an uncanny space. Like you go in that room and everything's a little off balance. The bathtub is tipping. It's unmoored. It's tentative. It's dependent on the environment. That bedpan, which is, again, an abject thing. You don't even know what it is. But it almost, from the other side, it almost looks like it's seeking. It has this, like, uh, anthropomorphic quality um, of, like, that it's breathing. It's tethered. Um, you know, it, it has some weird dependency on the exterior. 
Um, I looked at this and, and thought about that as a water line, that um, big thing there. And here is part of that narrative. As I projected the narrative, I selectively deleted um, some of the words. So again, like um, what Freud was talking about in terms of the disruptive narrative implies that it's not the whole story. So when you read it without some of it, you find a different narrative and uh, that emerges um, from there. So I'm experimenting. These are experimental pieces. So I'm experimenting with what that can mean. So we're taking these things out. And so I was so struck by this narrative because it really laid her bare. Um, when I thought, when, when um, a wonderful graduate student came into the space and stood there for quite a while and looked at the bathtub, which was really tipping more than the picture looked like, and she said, it's like her dirty laundry is being just exposed. You're like washing the dirty laundry in the tub, and the dirty laundry is being exposed. So this young woman's life was just put out for everyone to consume. And what was really interesting about the narrative was, the narrative was she was trying to jump off, she jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge, and um, she didn't die. Her skirts buoyed her up. Uh, no, no joke. And a crowd gathered, and they were just almost like cheering her on. It was really, really creepy. Um, so just the cadence of the, of the language, of who she ascribes, was in the habit of visiting and her interfere, warning her, betray her, provoked her. So it talked about something else. Oh, I'm going to go back for a minute. Um, so the narrative is titillating. It's an invasion of privacy, and, but it, it foregrounds her instability. It talks about her as this unstable girl, when really she was just in love and she was trying to commit suicide. It's really about more about us than it is about her, or more about the reader of the New York Times than it was about her. And I found that that was really interesting. And I'm trying to think about future work where I'm going to take contemporary narratives and think about the consumption of news and consumption of um, information. Another part of the, the other side of the room where you can't see it, because when you take a picture of something, you can only can't see what's behind you. Um, this was on a wall in very, very small, um, text. These were little books called the Little Blue Book Series, which were um, famous in the early 20th century. And there were these little books for a common consumption of like how to do things good. And they started out, um, they started out um, being um, really little stories and even some of the classics. But as time went on, people who didn't know anything about, who were not experts, started writing about things. And so I have a collection of these. And one is called The Nature of Dreams, and the other The Psychology of the Affections, which are really almost like popular how-to books. They're you know, just really lowbrow, um, self-help almost books. So um, here's the, another chapter of looking at the lovesick maiden narratives. Um, when I went to France, um, I knew that I was going to a medieval city, or it wasn't a city, a little village, a medieval village of Valeris. And Valeris is where um, Picasso made all his ceramics. And I had this little 400-year-old uh, studio, which is amazingly charming, with one kiln, and started to think about recreating some of the objects in the lovesick mating paintings for some future installations. So I've not made all of this, uh, the installations yet, but I'm going to show you a little bit. So I was looking at these alchemical al apparatus. In some of these paintings in, that I didn't show you, um, there was always these um, uh, science glass devices, like these um, beakers and things where they would measure the bodily fluids of, of women or men to see what was wrong with them. So I started to um, do some research on them. Um, here are some of the objects that I made um, in France, just pinching them out um, based on some of these medieval um, objects, and then, then I um, put them in the velvet chair and thought, wow, like a Flemish painting, who knew? So um, there they are. And this is black stoneware um, from Spain. Um, I did a, um, a, an installation in Le Cabanon, which was um, used to be an old, I believe, either they weren't sure, they're either a market or a stable, a wonderful um, maybe 350-year-old building. And um, these were just um, little, cha little kind of uh, vignettes um, around the room of some of my alchemical devices and how they would go. And the um, red clay is the local local clay that um, is there in France that Picasso used for all of his work. Um, another piece here. So trying to find some formal language and to see these are experiments and where they're going to go. This was um, part of a larger installation. This one's called Bodies and Cities. It was in the same room. 
Um, but one of the things that was happening in Valeris at the time was they were rebuilding the city, uh, the, the village. Um, a lot of buildings were just crumbling and falling apart because um, it, it really hadn't been renovated in a while. And so they were rebuilding. And um, I was um, trying to s s kind of get stuff around the town. So I was thinking about salvaging and, and, and re revamping and creating something new. And I wasn't sure what that was. But all of these objects um, I found in the, in the town. Um, there was a raw clay around this chair. This is only a detail shot of something else. But the linoleum came from um, a house where the priest used to live. And um, I was able to go in and get some um, personal effects um, of the village priest. And um, I'm currently working on a, a new piece with some of those artifacts um, in them. But I, I did manage to peel up um, some of that linoleum, which was freely given to me. Um, although I couldn't take everything I wanted because it doesn't look that good for an American girl to be ransacking the priest's house. Um, here's another um, section of that um, installation. Um, in taking some of the detritus from around the town, um, this golden thing in the front was the bottom piece of um, a staff that um, I think um, the book, like there was a book that the, the priest would read from, and that was the bottom piece that was broken. So I was taking a lot of broken things from around the town and repairing them to think about the idea of salvaging and salvation and reparation and repair. And um, Valerice is a pottery city. I mean, that's what um, it, it was there for. It was a lot of local clay. So in the back is a local Valerice brick that had fallen off of um, a windowsill one day um, next to the studio. Um, when a woman was crying and wailing, it took like wrenching, wrenching screams and knocked this thing over and it smashed down below. And her son had just gotten killed in a motorcycle accident. So um, when I went by, they were sweeping it up and throwing it away. And I, I couldn't bear to have it be throw away. So I, I used it. And the other one is, uh, is the picture that the priest would use. So it had a broken handle on it which I repaired, and um, that he would wash in the morning. And so the, um, the plastic things were the planters that they're now selling in Valeris, and, um, because they're cheap. So they still make clay planters, but they use a lot of those clear ones upside down, and I use them like a bell jar. So thinking of the bell jar and Sylvia Plath. Well, that's where I'm ending um, right now, and that's just some new work that I don't know where it's going to go. So, thank you. Can you have the lights? I will say one thing. When I talk about my work, this is retrospective. When I make my work, I don't know what it's going to be. I really don't. I, I know what I'm, I'm looking at. I know what inspires me. I make these kind of um, really intuitive connections. I get rid of a lot of stuff. I try again. And then when something starts to trigger something that maybe I haven't seen before or haven't thought about, then I feel like something's starting to happen or something's starting to generate. Um, I don't really care that people don't know what goes behind the work, but that they get something from it. I think a lot of artwork, a lot of literature, a lot of film is like that. That if you know some of the coded language, as an audience person, you can tap into some of it. But there should be something there for people who know nothing about that. There should be something visual, some visual pleasure, or something curious, or something unsettling. So I don't go into work um, in, a, in a way that a designer does. Um, designers might, or someone who um, plans a piece. I'm, I'm very intuitive in, in how I work and, and put it together. So that's just something you might want to know. I don't think all this stuff through and then make the work. This stuff comes after I look at the work. You know, I kind of know what's going into it, but I'm not quite sure what's coming out. Anything? I wonder, um, it's striking that a lot of your source material has a specific lens. Um, 
lot of the art in particular, the lens is very masculine. And um, you mentioned something that you're not um, you're not necessarily interested in being critical about um, this kind of like male-dominated history. But in your talk, it seems like what's particularly interesting is this male-dominated history in light of um, how utterly absurd it yeah. is now. And I wonder if you could talk a, about, um, you know, you just mentioned how like the work kind of evolves and you, you make choices after the work is started. I wonder if you could talk a, a little bit about um, the, the specific lens or voice you feel that your work has relative to some of the gender issues that you're interested in. Hmm. I think when I say it's not crit, I mean I, I wouldn't say it's not critical, but I'm not. Um, it's about just kind of presenting what I see or what you read, and that I think the cur the thing that is still interesting to me is how much of some of that um, history still is accepted in contemporary world. And it really depends on who you hang with. You know, we have a global world, and I, I once had somebody say to me, um, "Well." Uh, get off it already, you know, it's like uh, women have parody. I'm like, well, what planet are you on? <laughs> you know, look at what the museums are showing. Look at, you know, look at all the, look at all the shows on TV where it's all about the dress. I mean, I, I don't get it. it, it so I am sort of curious about that. Um, we're in a world where um, we've made great strides about things, but we can't forget that um, history is something that is, um, changes as we tell it and in which context. So I'm using this particular subject as something that I'm like really interested in to say that about the larger scheme of what one might think is truth or not truth. So I guess that's kind of it. Um, I'm not sure I answered your question, but I'm, I, mean, I am curious about how we consume information too. So that would be something that's coming into the future in terms of these like narratives um, and not just historical ones. But I, I'm kind of interested in that about how we consume the news and how we consume information and um, how it's kind of regurgitated back and then the next thing you know some old stuff is coming up again. You know? It's really curious to me. Um, I, I, someone asked me recently, um, how come you're so interested in like medical stuff? I'm like, I don't know, I fear death, how about you? you know, I don't know, I don't know, I, I really don't know. Uh, it's just fascinating to me. And that's the place where, um, I would say like, um, an idea of the material body and kind of a, a, something that is unknown or the spiritual kind of converges in in um, medicine and religion that's kind of where it is that's that's where you want to cheat death try to cheat death medicine and religion there's a lot of Catholic imagery in there lots you know I was a bad little Catholic girl you know so I just wanted to question it all the time so but in terms of um, and again this is a particular body of work, too. This is not the only body of work that I work on, too. Um, I do site work um, that has to do with other kinds of histories that have nothing, I wouldn't say no, they don't really have anything to do with feminism, have nothing to do with status of women, um, but they do have to do with history. Um, you know, I don't know what time it is. I'll probably show you a couple things. But um, like, for example, when we were at Watershed, um, Pritika Chowdhury and I were working in the beehive kiln. That was an interesting piece um, that I had done a previous piece in there, this bee beehive kiln. I could, I could probably show you these images if I can get out of here. How do I get out of here? Uh, yeah, then I'll get my desktop. Um, it was a beehive kiln that Okay, yeah, let's get rid of it. I probably have it. So you'll see something different here. 
Um, let's go here and let's put all this. I did a piece at Watershed, there's a big beehive kiln there, that, can you see that? Can I shut that light off? This is a flue of beehive kiln, six burner ports that I was in. And I just looked at this as this wonderful, like almost like a time piece, right? So the flue is there, which is this place of stilling water. So I'm in the flue, as you see. And um, at Watershed, I was looking at the, you know, the bricks, like what are, what's the language of water struck brick? And that is each side of a brick has a real name and that's how you place brick in landscape and in architecture. One side of a brick is called the soldier, the one that comes up. One is called the header that's down that side. That plane is called the header, the stretcher. So they say, well, we need six stretchers, four soldiers, and blah. that's how. And these, this language has been used for centuries in how to lay patterns in land and architecture. And so I thought that was really interesting. And when I saw this, um, I was just struck by it because at the time, um, this language was so potent for me. I was trying to do something in this big beehive kiln with six burner ports. And um, at the time, um, my son um, was a soldier in Iraq. So I see soldier, I see stretcher, I see staler, I see rowlock, and I, I just couldn't see it any other way. So I took these, this language and I cleaned out the kiln, which was just a mess, and all of the dirt on the bottom. Can you guys see that? Um, grab some lights. Thanks. And then, um, so here's the bricks. There's me in the flue. This is the kiln. There's the flue. And there's six burner ports evenly spaced, like this amazing cadence. And then there's this hole in the top where the chimney used to be. So it looked like a kind of a kiva or something. And all the dirt isn't dirt. It's just all old brick that had just like disintegrated down to um, watershed clay, unfired and clay fired. There's me sandblasting. I named all the burner ports where the fire comes out. So I have soldier. I have sailor, stretcher, shiner, header, rowlock. And I thought that it was really interesting to somehow brand these places where the fire comes out. And um, it, it felt like some sort of poetic expression of time for me. And for somehow that there would be maybe this sublime narrative of memory of the turning over of earth when one lays brick in land and architecture. So that was kind of, you know, a very different kind of piece. Then, let's see, when Pritika and I were there, we had been talking, I had another residency there, we had been talking about how to take, and this is a permanent piece, so how to take an existing work and to do something new with it, and to overlay um, a dialectical narrative onto something. So if I've got a dialectical narrative of something that has a poetic expression of time, but it's a little bit unnerving to see sailor stretch or, you know, like that there's something about the vulnerability of the body in there. We did this piece called Tomas um, together. She had been doing some... Um, some research on a particular time in uh, 1919 where there was this rebellion in India. She's um, Indian by birth, um, where the uh, British government opened fire on 5,000 men, women, and children and um, killed about 2,000 of them. But some of the people there had jumped into the well to escape, even though they were killed in the well. And so the well became this place of um, kind of an abject place um, and also bringing up this idea of suicides. Um, we had another um, text there, so we'll go back down here. Um, I was making these spittoons because um, there was another dialectical text that she was looking at, which was looking at Salman Rushdie's um, Midnight's Children, um, using the spittoon as a, as a metaphor um, for kind of the um, um, national identity of in India and um, where the one would spit. 
so we have the well and where one would spit. And um, so we did this timeline around of all the kinds of things that would happen in 1919. There's the well, which we built out of watershed bricks. Here's some spittoons. On each spittoon, we had drawn, just with pencil, it's raw clay, um, these events that were happened simultaneously in, in and around the year 1919, where um, we were thinking nothing happens in a vacuum, and all these very, very important kind of um, historical, so, uh, political events were happening around the time of World War I and at the time of this rebellion. So where, like, borders were being, being ch shifted. So it was like time was being shifted. And we just, and we put one for Maine, what was happening in Maine at the time. So here are these um, things in red around. These are just like this narrative of what was happening in this timeline, like a red narrative all the way around. So this is also very cryptic, and we considered this uh, basically an experimental piece to um, create a body of work, which we have yet to um, continue. So we took basically information that was there and historical information and just tried to create this really interesting, I mean, if you read the narratives, you have to like put together a story, really, and to think about that. So that's, you know, so I, I, I showed you basically kind of a one body of work over um, a certain amount of time. I guess I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah?